Well, tonight we have a saint with whom most of us, at least the Friday night crowd, if I could use the term, St. Hugh, summer Friday evening, the Friday night crowd certainly could <coughs> identify with. That is to say that St. Martha, out of her devotion to our Lord, wanted everything to be just right for him when he came to dinner. I don't know if the dinner was a particularly large occasion. Our Lord frequently went to Bethany, just a few miles out of Jerusalem, and it was a safe house for him. He felt comfortable there. He knew that he, he, they would be spying, that he would be well received, that they would listen to his words. And he and his disciples would get a good meal. What's not to like about that? I think every priest over the years has certain families that he enjoys visiting, probably for that very purpose, not just the eating, of course, but that the others might be able to eat too, that they ask questions and they want to, they want to learn from the priest. That was exactly the case, because our Lord wants to feed us while we're feeding him. And over the centuries, it doesn't change. That is to say, there's all the outside glory that we try to give to God, and in our churches, we understand that's very important. The altar, the linen, the serving, the music, and, and everything should be as beautiful as possible, as in this modest, but said, so beautiful little chapel. But at the same time, we know that our Lord is here because he wants to give to us, and he wants us to listen to him. And so, Martha, losing herself, and who hasn't done this entertaining sometime or another, loses her temper. She sees her sister Martha, Mary, and she's thinking to herself, there's Mary, useless as usual. She's just sitting there and listening. And here I've got all these guests to do, and I've got the, the first course to get on the table, and I've got the twelve apostles and the Savior himself. And she's just listening. She could do something, cut the bread, bring the, bring the wine out, something, but she doesn't. She's just wrapped. She's listening. And Martha gets cross, and she's the housekeeper, and she's used to expressing what she thinks. She doesn't hold back. And she says, Lord, aren't you worried? Doesn't that bother you? You're not doing anything to help. And then she, she receives from our Lord a proper and a justified rebuke. Martha, Martha, thou art careful, full of care, troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. In other words, he's saying, well, of course we have to eat, and, but it doesn't have to be perfect. I want everybody to be able to listen to me, and Mary understands that. That's why I've come to, I didn't come into this world to eat. To stay in the world, yes, I'm a man, I have to eat, but I'm not here to eat, I'm here to feed. And when Mary allows our Lord to feed him, she listens carefully to every word, then to feed her, then she's feeding our Lord. We have to understand that that's part of what Holy Communion is. We feed our Lord with such a hunger for our souls. The more hungry we are for Christ, the, the more we satisfy our Lord's hunger for us. So it was a justified rebuke for Mary, and the church, down throughout the centuries, once a year, reads this gospel. There are so many saints with whom it's difficult, maybe, for us to identify. I mean, saints of great, long, perduring, excruciating penance or horrible acts of martyrdom. But a Martha saint, we could identify with her. Not just women, but men, too. We want things to be right. And we, when we see somebody who doesn't seem to be pulling his weight, that bothers us, and we, we tend to say something, and then, of course, we miss the whole point, the whole point of incarnation and spiritual life and taking care of our Lord. But there's another gospel, and you know it too. I know it better than you because of all the funerals I've conducted over my years as a priest. But every time you go to a funeral, you hear that gospel, and it's the other Martha gospel. And if you don't keep that in mind, you wouldn't get a total picture of Martha. Now, 
A little bit later on after today's gospel, then our Lord allows her brother, there were three of them, unmarried, a brother and two sisters who lived together, Bethany, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. He allowed Lazarus, who was his dear friend, his dear friend, to die so that he could work the miracle which would presage or prophesy his own resurrection from the dead. And so he, he needed his friend to die so that he could rise again from the dead. And, but they don't know that. And so he tears, he gets the message from Martha. Domine quem amas infirmato. Lord, he whom thou lovest is sick. And our Lord doesn't go right away. The apostles wonder why they don't say anything. Then our Lord finally goes and he receives the message on the journey that his friend Lazarus has died. By the time he gets there, he has been buried. It's the fourth day since his death. And of course the Jews buried some on the same day. And the Jews are, they have their custom still today, they call it sitting Shiva. And they, they, they mourn the death by uh, sitting, in effect, and receiving friends and family who send in the food, by the way, that's probably the origin of that, for an octave for eight days. So our Lord gets there, and he doesn't go to the tomb right away. He talks to Martha first. That's interesting. Mary is at the tomb weeping, as she will be at our Lord's tomb weeping. But he talks to Martha first. And he, and, and Martha, always a woman to speak her mind, she says, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. If you were here, Lord, this wouldn't have happened. And then, then he rebukes her, these beautiful words that are still used at the burial service of the Catholic Church. I am the resurrection and the life, Martha. He that believeth in me, even though you were dead, yet shall he live. He that liveth and believeth in me shall not die forever. And then he looks at Martha and he says, Martha, believest thou this? And she says these beautiful words that we hear at every funeral. Yea, Lord, I have believed. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. A beautiful profession of faith. So Martha who was someone who comes across as someone, first of all, as many Catholics do, who want, they're sincere in their religion, but they're pretty determined they're going to do religion their way, and you better get out of the way or get with the program. Martha instead now is transformed into the believer. She's the one who believes. Everybody else, including Mary, who had listened all that time, she doesn't see it through her tears. Mary didn't have the faith at the resurrection a couple weeks later. She was at the tomb weeping. So strong was her personal devotion to our Lord that she didn't see the big picture, but Martha did. Wherever Martha was, at home with Lazarus, she knew our Lord would rise again. She is the believer. So you have these two aspects of, of, of Martha in these two Gospels, one's just once a year, and one is whenever there's a funeral in the Catholic Church. The Church reads today's Gospel as part of a rare, it's a ceremony that's rarely conducted, it's only conducted by a bishop, and it's called the Baptism of Bells, so in the old days, like St. Joseph had, for example. Those bells that ring were very solemnly blessed, and because they are washed with a special kind of a holy water called Gregorian water, and they're anointed, and then they're incense. It's called the baptism of bells, and each bell in a Catholic church receives its own name, and they're all dedicated to God's glory. Well, we read the Martha Gospel from today's Mass when the bishop baptizes the bells because what do the bells do? They call us to prayer, and what's prayer? not running around and taking care of stuff, although that's certainly a very important part of our worship. The prayer essentially is this, listening to our Lord. Speaking to him, yes, many beautiful things, certainly, but our Lord wants us to listen to him. And that's a part of prayer we must never, we do, but we must never neglect. So Martha's feast comes each year. On the one hand, 
so we can see ourselves in the mirror. Ah, I saved myself. I am a Martha soul, aren't I? Well, a little bit on the sharp side, a little judgmental, a little bit too much. I'm, on a, I'm, I'm a Sinatra soul, so I'm going to have it my way. I want to have everything pretty much my way. But then, then I realized with the rebuke, I've got to listen to our Lord more. But what matters most of all is that I should believe that he is the Christ and the Son of the living God. And very few are they who believe today. So that's the blessing that our Lord promises to us. And that's the great word of comfort, isn't it, that we hear at a funeral. Later on, you know what happened to Martha and Mary Magdalene and Lazarus. And one of the 72 disciples, his name was Maximus, and a servant lady of theirs. The Jews, after Pentecost, put them all into a boat. It was there like a little leaky boat, in effect, without a sail and without a rudder in the Mediterranean Sea, meaning that they should drown. And the boat would sink and they would drown. Only they did it. And through some miracle of God's providence, they were carried across the Mediterranean Sea to the south of France, to what they call Provence, to the town of Marseille. And there, St. Lazarus preached the gospel. He was the first bishop of Marseille. And St. Martha was tickled pink because she was as busy as busy could be, spreading the Catholic faith. And she drove out demons. She picked it with a dragon at her feet and with a holy water bucket because she would frequently sprinkle holy water to drive out demons. We should use our holy water frequently and devoutly. And um, she founded 12 convents of women in the south of France. And Mary, she was tickled pink too, because now was her time of just pure prayer. No more dinner parties, no more sister getting after her. She could just pray, and that's what she did. She, she prayed, and the tradition says, I visited the cave once in southern, in southern France. It's called La Sainte, La Sainte Bonne, the holy perfume or holy ointment, and in honor of what she had done once for our Lord, twice really. And um, there, as she prayed, she prayed the divine office. And in each of the seven hours of the divine office, she would fall into an ecstasy, that's the tradition, and angels would come and they would carry her up into heaven. And that's what we should do when we pray. We should not fall into an ecstasy necessarily, but we should have some little bit of a sense of heaven, of being carried up there. So sometimes even in this life, if you stick with it long enough, you get to do what you want to do, but remember, the point of it all is not to do our will, but to do his and to believe. God bless you. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.